This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Ulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier. And this week on Sound Notion, we welcome our guest, composer Johnny Reinhardt, uh, the curator of MicroFest 2014 NYC, taking place April 12th through 15th, presented by the American Festival of Microtonal Music, where he is also the founder, producer, and director. Johnny, thanks for being on the show. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me here. Um, so I definitely want to get into microtonal music. I think we all want to talk about this uh, very much, especially how this festival is happening right now in, uh, in New York. But I want to just ask a quick question. How does one go about deciding to realize Ives Universe Symphony? One has to, first of all, be interested. One has to find materials. One has to get the permissions. <laughs> one has to have the time. One has to have a multitude of different kinds of skills. One has to have patience. One has to have very, very keen eyes. Uh, one has to be able to revise and edit. One has to be able to put together their own orchestra. One has to be able to get the money to rent Lincoln Center. And then one has to deal with unions. One has to deal with recording it in the studio to finally have its first commercial release and write a book on how you did it until people are actually interested enough to look at it to find out what's involved. That sounds That's- like a lot of work. Seems like that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, I mean, I, just you know, in, in looking at some of your projects, um, that really that that struck me, and I, I know I know there have been a, a couple different attempts at, at realization. Um, uh, how, is this is this something that is is your version frequently performed? Uh, no, it's only been performed once by me. That's it. Uh, I was also the conductor. I see. So I, you know, and then. Uh, then we did it in a studio through Mike Thorne, uh, who's you know quite well known for for, for his work. He's uh, he put together um, direct to disc, uh, first four people with me conducting on video, and then uh, everyone played to that video, and that video was made years after the uh, live performance. So I had to pretend the whole orchestra was there, and then there would be a video of the video, so that there'd be because there was a second conductor, and then. You know, I got to play a lot of the parts. I got to play a lot of the percussion. I played all the bassoon and contra bassoon parts. And uh, it's an interesting, like, artifact, you know, to look at those. Yeah. Um, but it worked out. Uh, it, more recently, I found a digital recording that did not have added reverb to it. I had never heard it before. It's not allowed to be distributed it's not allowed to be commercial for union reasons but uh, it's unbelievable and now that's just a private little thing but that's a development of this recent year and we're going to play actually this uh uh live performance uh in croatia that's a plan wow great can't do it here (laughs) um so well, maybe that's... we should get get into the the microtonal music thing because this is another huge undertaking. It sounds like uh, based on some of the the videos that you sent us and, and reading some of the things that are on the program, uh, you are the the founder, as Patrick said, of the and as we all know, it's good to tell guests things about themselves that they already know. You're the founder of the uh, American Festival of Microtonal Music, um, and I'm curious as to how just to back up a little bit how you got into to microtonal music to to begin with well i think microtonal music is the natural you know way you come into the world and okay. you know, you're really taught out of it you know so like if i'm playing bassoon which happens to be you know my instrument since high school uh, i'm playing the most out of tune instrument in the history of the world used in the orchestra i mean that's its that's its reputation and so um, you have to be perfect and equal temperament to play bassoon microtonally. Right. And the, the whole strategy is to put some, uh, you know, deviations of what we call sense. You know, this is a twelve hundredths of an octave, a hundred for each semitone. Right. You know, we'll say plus four on the major second to make it the ninth harmonic. Right. And when it's the ninth harmonic, it's a consonance. You know, we don't think of the whole tone as a consonant, and we're taught it's not a consonant. So, but it's, you know, it's a um, a final harmony in Bosnian lullabies. Really? 
Yeah. And I have a friend who've used, who's used it very beautifully in quarter tone music, Robert Jergro. You know, nice final bomb. That's interesting. A little four cents makes the difference. Yeah, it's it's amazing how how just being in tune can make almost any interval sound really beautiful and consonant and and comfortable in that way, um, and and uh, that kind of harmonic tuning is is a, a part of that that we we lose in the the equal tempered world. And I think you point out interesting uh, interestingly that we are kind of conditioned away from this naturally open space. Uh, of of all the possible frequencies and pitches that we could hear, and and kind of slotted into these twelve spaces, um, and I, so once you are, are conditioned into that, how do you get your ear and the ears of the people that you you work with and you perform for back into a more open place? Well, as we you know spoke about earlier, I do that with children, you know, and to. Is I think the best bet, you know, have people yeah. grow up with that understanding, and it just seems so easy and so natural. But of course, I'm uh, working in an area that is apparently broken the law by having no music and art uh, classes, the Bronx. Really? So, yeah. So this, you know, or or even in Manhattan uh, in Queens, you know, they just took out music. So um, music, by the way, is eighty percent of the success of special education. Twenty uh, percent is dance. That's really, you know, that's that's what's being taught in uh, colleges. Wow. So, you know, when they take it out, they're doing, you know, serious damage. But uh, in terms of myself, I knew microtonalists uh, in the form of quarter totalists uh, in high school. Yeah. You know, my story is, you know, I waited till there was a subway strike and I couldn't get to Manhattan School of Music for, you know, one of my classes. And so uh, I just went to Central Park and started playing Mary Had a Little Lamb, a quarter tone sharp, a quarter tone flat. Did the same thing with the Mozart bassoon concerto, and you know had some fun with the disorientation orientation. Yeah. So, you know, and then, go ahead. Mm-hmm. No, well, I'm just I'm, in a, a interval like nah, nah. You can't play it on a piano. That's true. Everybody knows it. That's true. That's something that's unique to 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 a certain group of instruments, right? Not every instrument can can play with the pitch quite as much or as easily as. Uh, as as bassoon can as as you said earlier um so you, you said you you work with kids on microtonal music and i'm i'm curious about that program we talked a little bit about it as you mentioned before the show and i would love to hear about this program because i think you're absolutely right that kids are are really open to all kinds of things and if we can can introduce them to uh some of these other concepts early on they're going to be much more open to those throughout their lives we talked on the show about a a year or so ago about the possibility of uh, about a study about familiarity with dissonance and just knowing what the name of a quote-unquote dissonant acoustically dissonant interval is made people more likely to like it and feel that it's not pleasant or you know, hurtful. And so I think that kind of education for kids is really important. And we, we talked about the possibility of, you know, raising a kid that was listening to, to dodecaphonic but- music their whole lives. And if they would be able to hear some of the things that, that we say are often difficult for us to hear, uh, learning think, later. Think, is they're listening to their serial? Yeah, exactly. So I wonder if you can, if if you've had any experiences teaching kids to listen to microtonal music that you 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 could share. I actually present all music as microtonal. Interesting. Uh, if you were to go by the overtone series starting on A, and you just measured from C to E, and C was the nineteenth harmonic and E was the twenty fourth harmonic, it would actually equal four hundred cents, an exact equal temperament major third. Wow. Built in. Nobody recognizes that. I've never read that anywhere. I've never heard anybody notice it. When I bring it up, and it's very recent, I noticed it. The most, you know, erudite people can't imagine that that's the case. So, I mean, really, it's all connected. And, you know, I've written, uh, actually, I've written a book on Bach and tuning and, you know, how equal temperament actually played into the world of music. And it was active in the Renaissance as well. And the people who invented 
uh, irregular circular tuning, like Ant uh, like uh, Andres Werkmeister, actually started with equal temperament, played with it, composed in it, and they gave it up because it was redundant. Because, you know, if you go from another key to another key, it sounds the same. You know, so why would you be entertaining with it? Right. It it's, it's boring in contrast, but you have to be very sensitive to hear what we now call Werkmeister three tuning, where every key is a little bit different. And that's part of the expression that the composer brings to the music so that the piano sounds like a violin because it has that kind of sense that um, there's a different uh, sentiment for each key, each, each movement from one note to another. It's different. There's four kinds of major thirds. That's interesting. It makes the, uh, it makes the line from, uh, from Spinal Tap make sense where they say that D, D minor is the saddest key. Well, D minor is box key. Right. And D minor in Werkmeister three tuning is the closest to the overtone series. And if that's the most consonant, because overtone series is really a chord, those are just all notes that sound at the same time. Yeah. Um, if you want to have in a piece of music movement away from it to have the greatest expanse for emotion, expressive, creative uh, reasons. And all the major Bach works are in D minor. Dramatic, yeah. just, say Matthew's passion. I mean, it just goes on. But now you asked me a question about kids, and that's the easiest part, as far as I'm concerned. But for adults, that's you know more challenging. I don't know if you can see this. Probably not. But this is a chart. Or maybe you know, if I move it close, you get some idea. It has eight octaves of the overtone series. Wow. And it comes out to 128 notes. And there's no dissonance. Not really. Not the way we hear it, play it. And that's, what been, that's what we've been doing for the last two or three years. That's where we have two new CDs that just came out in what we now call 128 tuning. And somehow, I su suggest and maintain there is no dissonance. And, the, and you know, I could say it like philosophically, I could say it logically, I can say it because you're going to hear that when you take a listen to the concerto for fretless guitar. That's in 128 tuning. That performance had no rehearsal. Wow. And there's no score. Hmm. So you just winged it. I mean, so I would like to. <laughs> it didn't work out. <laughs> but even without the rehearsal, shock and awe to us because... You know, it worked. I, I put it in three movements, even though it's improvised. And any note in 128 works. And at the same time, I did make suggestions for the three movements of how to move through some of the notes. Okay. Did a score to tour on the – it's a lot of strings. So we, every string was different. So your act of composition there was to kind of set up the initial conditions and then turn it over to trustworthy musicians. Yes, I, I have a – Big respect for improvisation. And I, I think that, uh, well, I know for a fact that Bach was as great an improviser as he was anything else. Absolutely. And Werkmeister, who set the whole thing up, was really mainly an improviser. And the whole idea of making a circle of keys was for improvisation. Because if you're going to sit there and play for four hours like Books the Hoodie used to do, then you're going to be, you have to make it a full circle. You can't get stuck. Right. Where if you go any far further, you get a wolf that, you know, howls. That's what they would call it, you know, if you couldn't make a circle. Right. So, uh, you know, people who, who play in this tuning of 128, if they play any note in 128, they can't make a mistake. And so they can go right into improvisation immediately, which mm -hmm. is very helpful for adults. So you t you're talking about, when you're talking about uh, constants and dissonance here, you're talking about it in, in a kind of an abstract acoustic sense. Uh, obviously, we're still dealing with kind of more narrative consonants and dissonance um, over time, well, right? But I'm, I'm going to suggest to you guys, and tell me what you think, uh, that consonants and dissonance as a paradigm, I'm sorry for the big word, I don't mean uh, uh, to lose anybody, I actually want to bring you guys in, everybody who can you know, focus on this, consonants and dissonance is really, I think, based on the fact that the whole history of Western music since Babylonia 
has an overtone and undertone structure. We get our minor third for a mirror image of the overtone series. And it's a different series, and it happens simultaneously. That's what mean tone is for the Baroque period. That's what 12 equal came out of and, and continue to represent for 150 years. Right. So when you have this undertone series and overtone series at the same time, you have right and wrong notes. Hmm. But in the tuning I'm suggesting now of 128, there's no right and no wrong. So there's so, no dissonance. So you're, you're, that's, a, that's a really interesting concept. Um, but you, so if there's no dissonance, my so I think for if I were improvising in a system that had no dissonance, I would have a hard time uh, keeping the music moving forward because it, it it would it would seem to be very easy to let it sit in one place um, and 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 not require. I mean the, the that that idea of of resolution is the the thing that moves a lot of music forward. And it's certainly a thing that I think of in writing music that moves my music forward is the idea of, of a dissonance that resolves. And when I say dissonance, I mean it in more of a... Kind you don't of, necessarily mean a dominant seventh chord. Right. No, I mean like a, a, in a, a philosophical sense, in, a, in, in, in the idea of that there is something that needs to finish. Um, and, and I'm wondering where that or if that sense exists in this music and where it comes from, if not from uh, the harmonic dissonance. Well, this is a new universe. That's what uh, I'm alluding to here. It's a, it has its own rules. It's its own uh, syntax. Um, it doesn't modulate, for example, because it's all one chord. Right. And yet you start in any note and you move anywhere and it's new compared to anywhere else. So it's got so much variety, you don't miss tension release. But you do have tension release in a different way. Right. You have what we call tonicization, where you just can emphasize any one pitch as more important than any other. Okay. Right. Here so, we go. So how does one accomplish that? Tonicization, I mean, that's a term that anybody who's had college music theory has heard a bunch. So how exactly do we accomplish that? In the and for of people that, that aren't following the word tonicization, that's just making one pitch home, the, the central place. It implies doing it locally within a piece. Right. Where the, a traditional piece where there is a key overall, there'll be a part where this other thing sounds like it might be the home base. Right. Isn't, I want the, to hear, isn't the new buzzword centricity? Sure. I don't know. <laughs> you can make it that. So I want to hear what I, Johnny I has to say that. Okay, well... Uh, I hope you all brought your piston to class this morning. You know, you have Bartok uh, using it very effectively, ending uh, one of his uh, short works on, uh, on the fifth. Right. But just the way he approached the fifth, you feel that it's not the fifth. Um, in uh, the piece, uh, the concerto for guitar, for example, I, uh, in the, I think it's the second movement at the end, I made a little tag, you know, I did compose a little codetta, and it ends on an A, uh, 53 cents sharp. And you will never know that listening to it. It will sound like a, you know, a tonic A, because after all, this is the overtone series on A. So how possibly could we end a movement on an A 53 cent sharp? And it's, you know, nobody's psychology. You know, people with perfect pitch, they deal with it differently. They just have to fill in the cracks more and give labels. Uh, this, These are uh, high expressions of... Uh, uh, Harmonics basically reflect, I suspect, all the kinds of feelings we have. You know, so we're way past twelve sentiments. Mm -hmm. um, I think what drives it, referring to that earlier point, you won't believe it. And of course, when you hear it, you'll have to. That melody. It's an incredibly melodic tuning. It's always melodic. You don't want to sit. Yeah. No, yeah. And, and and I think it feels very melodic, very horizontal in a, in a score sense. There's a lot of both. counterpoint. Both. both. Right. Okay. Melodic, harmonic, and by the way, timbral. And I don't know what else it's missing, but, it, you know, it's only three years old. 
A fellow named Ed Brahms gave me the numbers. Reminds me of, uh, what's that Ornette Coleman concept? That he... uh, that's called Harmelotic. Harmelotic, yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, I work with Ornette uh, on occasion. I've been lucky to say that. And uh, he, um, uh, he's taking into account, actually, the clefs that the uh, transposing is. Okay. And he wants to have them all play the same note, but with their different clefs. Hmm. And that becomes a harmonic basis. Okay. He has his own clef, in fact, that combines them all. Huh. And his, his tuning, if, to finish up, because uh, no one ever discusses it, is he kind of elbows up pitches and elbows down pitches. Interesting. Cool. So that that reminds me of another question that I was going to ask you about, and and this is to me one of one concern that I have had performing microtonal music before and also listening to it is the the really precise control that the players have to have over their instruments, especially instruments that are like many of our instruments today engineered very precisely to not play some of those pitches that you're writing um is that ever a concern of yours when you're writing is is the the ability of uh, performers to 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 realize what you've written because a lot of the microtonal music that that i am the most familiar with is actually electronic where the everything is is very precise and it's it's you know going to be the same uh frequency every time it comes out of the speaker. Um, and I'm, I wonder if that's a concern that you have writing uh, acoustic microtonal music. I, I guess I have to say I'm privileged that I'm actually writing for particular people most of the time. Right. Uh, I do know how the instruments work and what they're capable of, you know, as a composer needs, to, I think, to, to be. Um, so it's never a surprise for me because, I, you know, I expect, you know, in New York City union rules, you can't even audition someone. You have to already know they're good. They don't allow it. You know, and there are lists of who's allowed to play in a group and nobody else can be added. It's, you know, very complex. So after you've been here a couple of decades, you, you build up. Uh, when we did the Universe Symphony, we had 77 musicians. I remember the union being very surprised two days before asking me in their headquarters, how, how could you do this? How could you put these people together? But, you know, musicians, they have their own raison d'etre. You know, they, they, they're doing it for reasons very uh, special. Uh, the, pre, the present uh, festival we're doing right now, we, we didn't get state funding for the first time this year. And everybody volunteered. And we have people coming in from Mexico, from the Netherlands. We have a critic who came in from Moscow. Um, it's a, you know, another fellow is doing a recital. He's coming in from Germany on the uh, Tuesday concert. And so it, it has an international role at this point of like-minded people. And we certainly hope that more people get to understand it. It's not a thing, really. It's everything. Yeah. It's just a question of, you know, how you file it. So you've been talking about the festival. We haven't really dug into that specifically. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the festival itself? And, and I know you kind of kicked it off last night as we're recording this, right? Um, tell us a little bit about the the festival and and where it came from and 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 what what you're up to this year with it. Well, you know, we talked about how when I came across a couple of people working in quarter tones in high school and then in college, I had actually you know promised I would when I got my master's I wanted to wait till I was good at equal temperament to start writing quarter tones, figure out the fingerings, how it worked. And there used to be a tuner that doesn't exist anymore. It was a chord tuner that would sing. Quarter tones. You could set it easily and it would sing. It was ugly sounding, but you could learn how to use that as your drone and find the right fingering. Uh, keeping in mind, guys, you know, that the inside of a bassoonist is quite flexible. Right. You know, like a low D on a bassoon has no fundamental. We create it artificially. There are actual, you know, scientific style papers on that. So, uh, I finally can do this. I put together this concert, and it's a mixed bag of styles, you know, Middle Ages, rock and roll, right? It could be poets with music. It could be, and when we did that, that's a big part of what the festival is, is. It's not a style. It's a vocabulary. It's a philosophy. 
Certainly his technique involved. I'll even go as far as to tell you these. Uh, you know, I wrote this little paper, three pages. I never published it when I just started the festival. And I've been talking about it a lot lately because it was so true, even though I never got published and nobody knows it. And it said that for a woodwind, I gave three reasons why playing microtone music was incredibly important and valuable and to be a virtuoso. And the first one was technique. I mean, if you put your hands, I have 26 keys and five tone holes on a bassoon. If I can move my fingers in the most amazing patterns, two keys at a time with one finger, shifting the hand, all kinds of things, the normal 12 are like nothing, just nothing. Well, let's, let's be clear <laughs> that playing equal temperament on a bassoon is no walk in the park to begin with. But it becomes easy. It becomes <laughs> a walk in the park, and it's not a problem. Yeah. You learn how to play it once, and then that's it. Well, listening, I think, is the same way. When you when you learn to listen to microtonal music, it makes listening to equal temper music so much easier. It's like it's like swinging three bats before you know when you're on deck. You get up there and you just got yeah. the you just got the one. You're ripping right through it. Yeah, that's like yeah. the microtonal and the atonal kind of. Yeah, you know, touching, you know, in that famous what's that pattern? I can't do it. Yeah, it's on the cover of the Universe Symphony, actually. That's the painting. A second one would be um, pitch acuity. I mean, certainly you're going to hear equal temperament pitch acuity better. And my experience is I'm the one who tunes the orchestra as a bassoonist because they know me. I do it with a chord, a multiphonic. I, I play a, 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 a C and I add the A uh, key very lightly. And it gives me a, and I hear the A in it, and then I play my A to it, and I'm in tune, A440. That's how I do it. Mm -hmm. I can explain why it works. It just works. And so I'm going to hear, I sing Harry Parch's music, for example. But what makes me absolutely different than everybody else I've ever heard of who did it is I don't have perfect pitch. So I'm doing it in a different way, and it's a way I hope is going to relate to more people who don't have perfect pitch. Hmm. And it's the idea that, you know, I'm, it's all interval relationships. It's relationships. Meaning comes from intervals. That's where meaning in music lies, at least one big sector of it. Yeah. So pitch acuity. I can hear one cent. I can train you to hear one cent. I train myself to hear one cent. If you can hear one cent, the audience doesn't have to, but they're going to be more impressed by what you do. It's and, going to have and then you walk away hearing half steps as these like giant caverns. That's true. <laughs> that is true. And then and the third. third I, I, well, you know, if you want to, you know, go ahead. No, no, no. No, no, no. I want to hear it. the third reason. It's a, third reason. The first yeah. two, they're really good, right? Yeah. Third one. You want to have a signature sound. You want to have a sound of on, on an instrument that when people think of the instrument, they think of you. And that sound that's going to be you is a sound that not only expresses everything that's you, but everything of the instrument. You want the sounds that are ugly, the sounds that are even prettier, the sounds that are, are you know, a myriad of uh, ephemera, of, of uh, fantasy. And then that all distills and becomes your sound. And I, you know, that's a major goal of musicians is to develop that. And that comes from strict microtonal work. So just doing a little microtonal every day will take care of most everything else. Like eating kale. Come on, just do it. It's good for you. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, so I have a question. Um, the first question is, is pretty dry, but you talked about perfect pitch. Now, I've had a sort of a, I don't know about this, but it seems to me people say perfect pitch. Uh, when you meet people, what they mean is, I have perfect equal temperament pitch. That's and true. I never never really understood, because people will say it's like natural, I just have perfect pitch, but equal temperament is not a natural acoustic phenomenon, is that correct? I mean, it's like we're, I don't know, we artificially sort of invented equal temperament, and now people say they have perfect pitch and they can hear that. I, I'm sure that you have something to say about that, and that's what I'm here. <laughs> uh, there's a fellow named Matheson living at the time of Bach who I think had perfect pitch. 
based on what his writings. He wrote over 100 books of music. And he's so shocked by different people's reactions because they don't have it. And so it's easy to see he had it. Uh, maybe someone like Savour, who is like half, you know, pretty much deaf and mute, who's the inventor of acoustics as a science in 1700 in France and a buddy of the king of France. How that happens, I don't know. Probably perfect pitch. But I don't think whether Bach had it or not, it was in use. And he probably liked just I use him as a, as a, a stepping stone for understanding music. That's why I come back to Bach. Because that's what musicians tend to do. He's, he's, he's the musician's musician. And so um, I think he came up with a tune and then he picked the key. And he probably did pick the key based on the instruments and which keys they play well. And you can figure that out because of the way he does his transpositions. If he takes the same piece and he rewrites it, he take, like the oboe concerto is a rewritten harpsichord piece, but he's writing it in D minor for oboe, that wonderful, perfect minor key. So, uh, I don't know. That's pretty much. Uh, I think perfect pitch is uh, you could fill it in, like learn quarter tones, learn third tones, learn eighth tones, learn sixteen tones. The best of them, two cents, and they have to learn how to hear one cent, even as they have perfect pitch. Dave Edgar, the cellist in Odysseus, perfect pitch, but it was two cents. <laughs> Joshua Pierce, a pianist, you wouldn't think it would be that good. One cent. He could do it. John Catlow, one cent. Uh, and then I don't want to embarrass people who are six cents. But I would say that almost every ear training teacher in the world, in every country, teaching Western music, has perfect pitch. It's just a natural fit job that the school puts them in. Which means they don't relate to the people who don't have it. I had a, a lot of trouble. They didn't know how to talk to me. Well, let me ask you this. So if somebody has perfect pitch, does that mean that they would also have perfect pitch listening to your tuning system? Yes. Hmm. Okay. That's what I, happens. The, other, the That's other question I have is sort of about the, uh, I don't know, the culture of, of microtonal composers. And, and I have very limited experience. I've been to a, uh, a composer symposium where one day was dedicated to microtoner music. And my takeaway was that, A, there's a lot of talk about math that escapes me pretty quickly. But it's like guys explaining how they came up with whatever their system is. And there's math involved. And the other one is, is that these guys, and I have to say, uh, I sense this in you as well, are sort of evangelists for the cause. Like, they think microtonal music is special, and it needs to be spread, and it's very important, and it's not just something that they like, it's something that's like their mission to, to prove its value to the world. Well, you know, if you're in love with something, or someone, you don't want to keep it a secret. Right. You want to share it. And if it's an open-mindedness that's going to affect everything that they're dealing with. I, you know, I like to, people to keep in mind that musicians are one of the rare human beings that use their left and right brain simultaneously. You have to really use the full brain. And that's why they're always alluding to musicians are smart. And musicians just chuckle when they hear that. Because they're not especially verbal. So when you talk about this symposium, which I probably didn't even know about, it's going to be put together by people who like math. And, you know, and so because they like math, they only ask people who like math. Uh, math is, it's got a, you know, artistic side to it. Math by itself can be beautiful. I can recognize that. It's not natural in me. But I would say in the, like a PhD, you get a PhD. I don't have one. It didn't work out. I tried. But if you have a PhD, and by the way, at this point I do because of just my lifetime, you can then have a PhD with everybody else in every other field. It just, you know, it puts you on a level of thinking, being aware. Now, the world is not doing well, and I think most people agree with that. I don't think there would have been as much agreement even 15 years ago. And equal temperament is hegemonically the tuning of the world in terms of commercialism, in terms of America, in terms of the West, in terms of Australia, you know, in terms of Africa, juju music, all kinds of things. 
a man named Ivor Darig, a very interesting pioneer in the early 20th century in uh, California, Glendale, like you said, loved it so much. And he just telling everybody and sending out free newsletters and making instruments, giving them away, making tapes, sending them out. He got no money, lived in poverty his whole life. Um, he believed that equal temperament, the tension of this artificial tuning, this this setting a 12-inch ruler, which in itself is completely arbitrary to some English king's foot, that setting this up creates a tension in the world and actually is aiding and abetting this increasing tension. Uh, just intonation is a is the most famous alternative to any kind of temperament. Uh, it is with the undertone series, so it's got the right and the wrong and the tension release. But when you're on the release, there's no beats, there's no interferences, there's no acoustic um, challenge. It's so harmonically related, you only hear some solid state name of an interval. You don't hear two separate notes anymore. Yeah, it's almost just uh, timbral coloring, right? You're just kind of sh shifting the the timbre more than anything else in that in that system. That's so ingrained in the the overtone series because that's the way we're already hearing these sounds. Like you said, everything's a chord basically. So when you're when you're playing music that's all emphasizing that series, you're just playing through that chord, which we hear as as you pointed out, almost like a single tone that is just shifting color. Um, so that's, that's a really, really cool observation. Um, could you, what, what would, what are people going to, sh should people expect to hear uh, if they show up to the, to the festival this week? What, well, are, tonight, what sorts of things are people going to hear? I'm very excited. It's eight 30 tonight. I'm, they're all different times. I want to say um, I'm very excited about uh, a string quartet that I wrote in China about four months ago. Um, I just found like nothing to relate to around me in China musically. And so it became like the, 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 just the right soundboard for me to compose. And I uh, took the sixth, uh, excuse me, sorry, seventh octave of the overtone series and used only the virgin pitches, which are the ones that only appear for the first time in the seventh octave, none, none of the redundancies. Mm -hmm. And then I got these 32 pitches, wrote it out note for note, and that's the first piece that we're going to hear tonight. Uh, in a premiere. Uh, there's a fellow from uh, Iran, uh, Shaheen Mohajeri, who composed a piece for me that he plays on tombak, microtonally. Huh. So it'll be bassoon and tombak uh, virtually uh, in a way that uh, is, is kind of special in its own intonation. We'll call it idiosyncratic intonation. <laughs> um, we, you know, we have uh, 128 improvs every night. Because as you very clearly, you know, reflected, it's not supposed to work. It shouldn't happen that you throw seven people together and it always sounds good. You know, it's not supposed to It's almost to like happen. you're tempting fate. You're like, tr bring it. Try to make it sound bad. What do you, it's, what you got? <laughs> yeah. It's part of the experimental factors. Yeah. That's it's, great. You know, uh, even last night, you know, everybody seemed so happy, and it was a big party afterwards. And I have no idea because I was so involved. Yeah, I'm going to need to take a step back, listen to a recording. But yeah. it all works, and if you're in the moment, you're only dealing with your line and how it fits with everyone else. Now, whether you want to say it comes from one hemisphere or another, when you are driving yourself linearly in one direction as a solo melodic instrumentalist. But it has to absolutely fit what everybody else is playing simultaneously. Yeah. You're using your whole brain. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's as melodic as it's harmonic. Yeah. And it just moves. So this guitar concerto is uh, amazing. I mean, I arbitrarily decided it would be in three movements to get a sense, you know, of some variation and change. It's for uh, a string quartet, but uh, double bass instead of a second violin and two bassoons. Yeah, so let's listen to a little bit of that now. Yeah, I hate to suggest something radical, but I know we enjoy we're talking, we're talking about, about it. So, it, so let's play it. You know, <laughs> let's let's play some music on the music show. 
Um, so this is a little bit of an excerpt of this recording that, that we've been uh, talking to Johnny about. And this is improvised, and this is in the, that, that 128 tuning system that we've been talking about, 128 pitches per octave. Um, and uh, this is from the 2012 festival, is that right? Correct. Um, this is one of the first uh, large pieces. Yeah. And so this Enjoy. is this is you would say this is a a composition of yours in that you kind of outlined it, but then there's a lot of improvisation as well, right? Correct. So here it is, this is a concerto for for fretless guitar. So that was an excerpt from uh, a video that you can watch all of, and we will link to that in our show notes. I watched the whole thing on YouTube of an improvisation um, that was outlined by our guest Johnny Reinhardt, and uh, of of a concerto for fretless guitar. And I can completely hear what you're saying when I listen to that uh, about it being very consonant. The whole time, and in fact, the the first time I listened to this after you, you sent us these links, I I I had to make sure I was really focusing to even notice that there was something that was unusual about the the intonation because it felt so, for lack of a better word, so natural um, that it, it it felt it. You know, we've heard so much microtonal music that is very dissonant, deliberately so, and this is the opposite of that and it feels so open and so natural and and in a way and this is going to sound strange but in the same way that i think copeland feels open and natural with those big open fifths and octaves and and ninths this feels open and natural to me in a very similar way oh sorry i have you muted sorry go ahead well i'm just mean that it shouldn't in terms of what anyone could naturally expect yeah to say there's going to be 128 possible pitches, everybody's just going to play whenever they want, whenever they want, whatever they want of those notes, and it's going to sound good and consonant, it, it shouldn't be possible. Yeah, the way I think of it is like when I was listening to that, if I were to play that for a room full of 18-year-old freshman theory students, I think that they would take to that a lot more than they would take to equally tempered atonal music, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> because it sounds so harsh and grindy, and that they really repel from. But that, I mean, they would think it was weird, certainly. But I, 
I think that they wouldn't be turned off by the just acoustic quality of the pitches. You know, another thing that it reminds me of, and this is weird to put these things together, is the very ap- approachable nature of the close uh, harmonies of of like like Debussy. Is the 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 the, the second su- secundal harmony in, in Debussy is, is something that 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 sounds like a lot to me. Is that weird? Does anybody else hear anything like that? Well, I can tell you that it's uh, in the thinking of Stravinsky. Oh yeah, Stravinsky of all of the composers of the last century was thinking in straight harmonics. <laughs> and uh, you know, the right of spring starting on C, ending on an E flat, with A as being the prominent tonicized pitch. Um, I want to tell you, E flat, the uh, devil in music, the tritone on yeah, A. Yeah, yeah. Right? The tritone is the devil in music? Right. It's not true. It's an exact harmonic. It's the, I think it's the 181st. Yep. 181st harmonic of all of equal temperament. That's the only pitch, the actual middle of the octave, is a harmonic. Well, and that's it's interesting. Uh, I think in... Um... I think it's Persichetti that I'm thinking of in his book about harmony. He describes the tritone as actually in outside of its tonal context. It's very consonant. And he, and he actually just, he describes it that way or no, no, no in a, it, yeah, I think it's in it, what he says in a, maybe it's in a dissonant context. It sounds very consonant. Um, it, but his point is, it's very contextual. In the in the context of functional harmony, we have turned it into a dissonance. But like you're pointing out, it's not necessarily acoustically a dissonance. It, it turns out to be the, one of the best notes on a bassoon. Really? The E flat. Just so two and three fingers of just the open holes. You wouldn't think that Stravinsky in the Rite of Spring would have been very kind to the bassoon. <laughs> well, he actually, that was one of his uh, favorite instruments, it turns out. <laughs> he, he used to soon a lot. Um, I don't know. It, it, it just, um, I just think that uh, the beginning of intonation on the planet was straight harmonics. And there's remnants of it, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the forest pygmy, I guess, you know, or uh, negrito, or just the om sound, or the Tibetan harmonics. You know, that's the beginning. Then when you got to the Neolithic period, people moving into villages, uh, Sumeria, Babylonia, you started piling on fifths. So that became the new uh, paradigm. And it lasted a very long time. Then you had individual tribes doing idiosyncratic like we have in the Balkans. Um, the the uh, Greeks were on tetrachords, on fourths, like the Persians, like uh, perhaps the Thracians. Then we went to the fifths. Then we switched it from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance by John Dunstable coming out with harpsichords and mean tone. Then we went to irregular tuning coming from Thuringia, Germany, because that little part of central Germany is irregular. The blocks in the street, the window shapes, the door shapes, uh, Martin, Luther, uh, Martin Luther's uh, church steps where he throws the ink on the, uh, at the devil they're different sizes each step. They turn, they, they come in a little twist, and they're all of different sizes. This is the, the character of these people. That's Bach. So when you stop pushing that in equal temperament, I think Schubert's the best. He's the, I now listen to Schubert as microtonal music because it's now using equal temperament tonally. And he's the master. He used the guitar to compose yeah that's very I, cool you can't take wagner at equal temperament there's no tristan chord right if you if you take at equal temperament that's interesting I, I i wonder what that would sound like even we should try that um <clears throat> so that's a, 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 i think an interesting place to leave it is is that comparison between the 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 equal temperament context of of history and the and the the more natural just temperament of history uh, and how that applies to those musics and people should definitely go check out this music if you're watching this and you have and you have time and and opportunity to go see it in new york um they can they can find all the all the programs at afmm.org right correct 
Um, so, so definitely check that out. We have just a few um, headlines that, that we want to make sure we, we hit this week. Um, we spent a lot of time talking to, to, to Johnny, and I'm glad that we did. And it was a great conversation. Um, and so we're going to save some of these things for next week. We're going to be talking with our own Anthony Landman. If you've not been following the relaunch of his great show, All the Cool Parts, um, you should definitely tune in next week. and We'll talk to him about that and all the things that he has going on. Um, and we'll also talk to, to Anthony uh, about uh, uh, the, this recent dust-up about music criticism. And uh, we'll talk about American orchestras and their relationship with uh, American composers, because obviously that's something we, we never talk about enough on the show. Uh, and, but it's obviously also a pretty fraught relationship. Hey, uh, I think that all three American pieces were played by orchestras this year. That's right. All of them. All three of all them. All three American too. pieces. Right. Um, so, but we do have some, some, some things we want to make sure that we touch on. Um Sam? Friends of the show, Andy Akio and Paula, Paula Matheson. Matheson. Uh, friends of the show, Andy Akio was on Sound Notion here, and Paula was on our newer show. Is it our newest? It yeah, might newest be Patch show. In. We call Patch it our In, our show. electronic music show. Um, so I'll put, I'll put actually put links to the episodes that they were on in the notes. But they both won uh, the Rome Prize for Music Composition, so congratulations to those uh, Sound Notion alums. Um, <laughs> and another highly anticipated announcement, um, CBS did a poll. This one's kind of ridiculous, but I wanted to bring it up <laughs> to, to, to irritate Dave. Just to bo- bother me. Yes. CBS did a poll about what the sexiest instrument is, and in a horrible, horrible miscarriage of justice, bassoon wasn't even on the list, right, Johnny? <laughs> so who? Oh, well, wait, Sam, you can't leave us hanging. What was the sexiest instrument? They didn't put microtonal bassoon. Oh, there. I'm sure that's the problem. It just was. This was actually going to be a great, uh, like, uh, editorial kind of thing on the criticism stuff, but. Um, guitar, 26%. Saxophone, 25%. Um, piano, 21%. Violin, 14 Drum, 7 And flute, of all things. Well, I think they're they're thinking of Anchorman, right? And that's yeah, what they talk about. Only if it's about. Yaz Flute. Yaz Flute. That's right. a, obviously, it's a stupid poll. Uh, and and I... It, I it doesn't it, mean anything salient, at all, ever. It's salient in this fact. As a saxophone player... The fact that saxophone is just below guitar and being equated as the sexiest instrument, that is a drag on saxophone players. I don't think they're talking about the the Barrio Sequenza 7B. Yeah, right? but still, I mean, like playing in a jam band. When I was playing in a, in a you know, I considered a very brainy jam band, you know, I'm still the All saxophone All jam bands player. think of themselves as brainy, Sam. That's right. But we actually how... were brainy. Right? I, jo- I mean, Johnny's jam band's pretty brainy. I don't yeah, know how the so, trombone couldn't have made that list. It's so sultry. Uh, what about so sultry? Anyway, well, they but, have a but, reputation. They're the plumbers. Right. <laughs> let, me, let me put it this it's way. Like the, it, uh, the empty, what is that? That blues. The empty bed blues with the, with the trombone player, right? And his big, long, sliding thing is in the, in the lyric. <laughs> you guys oh. know that one? It's pretty racy. You should check it I out. I don't know that. It's called the empty bed blues. Educate but, yourself. <laughs> I don't know. I've always felt like I'm going up against the, the oh, I love saxophones. It's so sexy. You know, I, I hate hearing that. I'm like, oh, you know, it, it's not something to, to channel sexiness to you. It's just an instrument. Right. I, I think you're mistaken about that, though. I'm pretty sure that's why Adolf <laughs> Sax invented it. Uh, was actually, it was in the patent, was uh, a sexiness channel, a method for channeling sexiness through, uh, <laughs> through a woodwind instrument. I think is on the patent. Now, this through, last story barely goes. for somebody who's nerdy about music and Johnny, I hope you really take this as a compliment such as you are. Um, uh, this might be interesting to you. It's uh, just a quick thing that was on the, uh, what is it? NPR music blog called what does sound look like? And by using a technique, I should have taken a note on this, but I took a bunch of notes on music criticism. That you, Sorry. You, oh, called, uh, Schlieren flow visualization. It's a way to uh, 
film things like body heat, um, but it'll also do what sound, like when you clap your hands, because uh, sound is an air wave or a, a pressure wave moving through the air, right? And this is just a way to see those pressure waves. And uh, we'll have a link to the video, but it's pretty cool to watch. They do all kinds of different things where you can actually see the sound coming off of the object, like a huh. hand clap. And a That's interesting. Drum. It's yeah. it because it's interesting because last I mean, either the last episode or two episodes ago of the new Cosmos reboot on Fox featured some of some examples of them trying to show pressure waves in different ways on on TV uh, to to demonstrate things about light waves. Um, so it's it's really I, I I think it's interesting to try to look at these things because they're invisible but are. Uh, the, They're hitting the you basis all the time. of everything that we do as musicians. Right. Um, so would, what, they Sam? Didn't do this. They didn't do this, but I would love to see that camera pointed at an orchestra. Everything they do is a very isolated object, and I just don't know if that's the only way it'll really be effective so that you can see something. Right. Um, but, you know, NPR, I know you're listening, and we want to see um, a video of, like, an orchestra or a brass band or somebody with this technique. Yeah. That's what I want. Would be very cool probably would break the internet it probably um, so and and like sam said we're going to save that discussion of music criticism we've put it off now twice uh, but we've had some really interesting long discussions with our guests these last couple of weeks and we didn't want to to shortchange those conversations and also because we have anthony on next week we'll probably spend a lot of time talking about music journalism and so it will be uh i think a, an appropriate topic for for that discussion with him um talking about music journalism and the future of music journalism and whether this weird thing that we do is on the internet is journalism uh, is I think an interesting discussion and where we fall on the, on the spectrum, if you will, of, of that music criticism discussion uh, between Ted Joya and um, I'm blanking on the, the guy's name who said Ted Joya is dumb. Um, uh, I thought it was a Anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jody guy. Rosen. Oh, lady. Yeah. Jody Rosen. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so we'll definitely be talking about those things next week. Uh, join us. Tune in. We do this show live every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And you can watch us at live.soundnotion.tv. Uh, please join us in chat if that sounds like something interesting to you and you'd like to contribute to these conversations. We would love to have your thoughts uh, shared live on the show. Uh, we do watch that as we're putting the show together. If you can't watch live, this show and all our shows are available on demand on our site at soundnotion.tv slash SN and also on our YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to. You can leave a comment there. You can also uh, catch up with us on social media. So you can uh, follow us on Twitter. We're at SoundNotion. I'm uh, at Dave McDoe. Patrick is at Vox Shibuya. Sam is at Housegoy. And uh, you can continue these conversations with us there. Uh, Johnny, are you on Twitter? I'm, I never really got into the Twitter. That's all right. That's all right. I just thought I'd plug your, 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 your Twitter stream if you were. Um, you can also uh, like us on Facebook and have that conversation continued there as well. Um, and we, we always really appreciate people uh, engaging with us after the show. We talk about these things because we think they're interesting. And hopefully you're tuning in because you think they're interesting. Um, and we would hate for the conversation just to stop when I stop the recording. Um, so uh, check, check in with us there. You can subscribe to this show and all our shows at Sound Notion TV in the iTunes store. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, you can use the Amazon affiliate search link on the right side of our site um, just to search for whatever it is you're normally buying on normal Amazon, and it doesn't charge you anything extra, but we get a little commission for sending you there, and so that helps us out a lot. Uh, thank you so much for watching or listening. Uh, we'll be back next week with Anthony Lantman. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Love. Thanks again so much for watching. We'll see you back next week.